Hey guys, welcome to the channel. In this video, I'll be showing you how to use the Python multiprocessing library using which you can understand how to create different processes using threads and how to apply to your use cases and also understanding the behavior of Python multiprocessing. But before starting, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. It really helps me a lot. So let's get started. Now in this, I'll be using a Jupyter notebook. I'm using VS code with Jupyter extension and IPython kernel to show you how the code is going to work, but you can basically use it anywhere. You can use it in, in general Python files and run it using Python command. Other than that, I'll be showing you how the Python processes behave in real time on the process task list. For this, I'll be using the command ps3-n to get the process nodes. So I'm using WSL to show the process trees and I'll be executing Python in it. In this, I'm getting the Python PID and using that PID, I'll be using watch command to get the task and PS3 in real time. So let me just restart this kernel and show you how you can do it too. You can just go to your terminal and say ps3 hyphen n hyphen p. Hyphen p is to get the PID for each process and in this tree you can search for python. The python process PID is 3202. So I will go back here and pass in the PID as 3202. Hitting enter it would give me the child processes for this main parent process. So let me just put this on the side. Now I have already written some code to get started with, but I'll be typing on the go to make you more understand on this concept. So the main library that we'll be using is multiprocessing. That's what's the library called. But in this multiprocessing library, there are certain classes and we'll be using those classes to write the multiprocessing code. So instead of the statement, I'm just going to write from multiprocessing import. The first class that we'll be learning is the pool. Pool is used to create actual Python processes. Once I execute the code, you can understand from the PS3 how it exactly looks in the actual process that goes on in a Linux kernel. Now let's execute this to import the library. Now to execute anything, we can do a lot of different approaches, but the main approach that most people use is executing or mapping the multiprocess task onto a list or an iterable. The iteratable can be anything. It can be either a list, a set, a dictionary. It doesn't matter because for Python multiprocessing, the order doesn't really matter. Python is not going to take care of the order in which the items are processed. So a list or a set, it really doesn't matter. But for this purpose, I'll be using a list so that we can hold duplicate values. Now to create or basically start using this pool that we just imported, we first need to define an object for it. We can call that object as p for pool or process or anything. It really doesn't matter. We will initialize the class pool and in this initialization, we can pass the number of processes. If you keep it empty, then it's going to be equal to the number of codes that you have on your CPU, but I'll keep it to Two because I'm just processing three tasks and we need to see the behavior how it exactly behaves. After defining it, the pool has a map function on it. Map basically works that we define a function and that function would be mapped onto each and every value that we are passing as the iteratable, in this case, the list. So first we will be defining a function. def unit task and we'll be passing in a variable in the signature and we'll be returning this number that's it now to map this function onto these values we type in the name of the function and 
the iteratable that we want to pass in. In this case, the list L. Now, before using this, we do need to remember to close the pool. So, if you don't close the pool, the process is gonna still linger as child processes and we don't want that. Now, we'll be passing this inside a function. So, just for safe coding practices and not messing up with the processes because it's not gonna stop and Python is gonna think, hey, this process is gonna run forever. So I'll just define the function as process and passing everything inside this function. Not passing, but like keeping everything inside this function. And using if underscore name underscore equals main then execute process. Let's bring this function inside the cell. So if I run this, okay, now it executed. It was really fast, so we were not able to see what happened here. But let me just add a small time delay in this to see the Python process is spin up. Import time, and we'll do a time dot sleep. For let's say two seconds. Let's execute this. Do you see that? It executed and spun up two child processes. The brackets, the curly braces that you see here are child processes for this process and the non ones are actual top level processes. So let me just execute this one again and let me add a delay for five seconds. So let me execute this again. I added processes as two and it spent up two different process. Now let me make the process as four and execute this again. If I create four, then you can see a four different processes are being spawned up. Now one thing to remember here is these are Python processes. These are different from threads that you may have learned in other processes. Something like a node interpreter or a Java JVM threads. The next thing I'll be explaining is the significance of p.close or pool.close. Now, whenever we are executing some task in parallel, it is not necessary that the task is always going to get completed. There may be some cases where the task is still going on due to some error or for some reason. And after the task completes, we don't want the processes to linger around. Even they are not doing anything, they are still there in the process tree and we don't want that. That's why we use p.close. Now in this execution, we are iterating over the number. Let me just make this back to two and okay. So when we map something onto this function, we are returning the number. So think about this. We are executing something in parallel, but we want the results to be returned. So after mapping this in parallel, we can get back the results that we wanted. So we can just say result equals P and let's just print this result. If I execute this four processes and this is what's written. Now we can do some execution on it and we get back that result. Now, another map function that we have is map.async. In general, map creates blocking processes. Unless the task is completed, it's not gonna go further. But if you have certain IO bound operations or you want the code to run in asynchronous, we can use map.async. What map.async does is it returns a callback. The result that we get is not the list that is interpreted. If I just run this right now, what we get is a multiprocessing pool map result because the actual process has not been executed yet. It did spin up because we defined a pool and we just closed it, but we didn't get the result in it. To get the actual result, we will rename this to something more sensible. We can call this a function callback. 
and to execute the actual function the result will be function callback dot get now I'll rename this variable to something like let's say task and the result will be result equals task dot get now if I execute this function we get the result as 246 so basically what happened is when I use map.async I created the task for it but the task won't actually execute unless I use task.get on it and yeah we close the pool and print the result now another python process that we can use for multiprocessing is a thread pool. Now in pool what Python does is it creates separate Python processes but sometimes when you are using more higher level functions and other frameworks or libraries that have a global context associated with it and certain contexts cannot be passed to for the Python processes. So to explain this so if I have a global context of let's say you are using spark so this is a spark context now what would happen is if you try to access this variable inside this function it's not gonna work because certain context cannot be passed to for the python processes and if you try to access that context in that function that is being executed in some other Python process what's gonna happen is it simply won't able to find that context and it would consider that variable as non-existent so this could create some problems to overcome this there is another library in Python processing sorry multiprocessing dot pool and there is something called a thread pool a thread pool is basically it uses actual Python threads inside the Python interpreter and uses this in threads to execute everything in parallel. So I can do the same task with this. Let me just import this and instead of defining a pool, I will define a thread pool. Now the functions are the same map async or map. Both of them have the same functions. I'll just rename this to result and p.map. Let me just remove this and execute this. Now, if you see whatever that was spawned here had braces in them. Let me just increase the time to explain and set the processes to. So if I execute this, you can see that not actual processes are executed but the child processes are being executed inside this process so these are basically threads inside the python when it executed the process that had braces on them it basically means that these are child processes and these processes are threads inside the only python kernel these processes don't have their own python kernel when i used to use pool the processes that are spawned are without braces what it basically means is that Python processes have their own Python interpreters with them if I create processes with two there will be two new Python interpreters that would be spun up and the code would be executed in those interpreters while using thread pool there is only one Python interpreter and that executes the threads in parallel if you need some other videos on Python multiprocessing, let me know in the comments. Do subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting more videos on a lot of different programming concepts, how to use different libraries. And if you want me to create a specific video, feel free to mention that in the comments too. Thank you for watching this video. I hope to see you soon.